Let us turn in our Bibles once again to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 8, Matthew's Gospel and chapter 8. One of the many challenges we face today is remembering our passwords and our PIN numbers. How many times have you been on the phone uh, to your bank or to your internet provider or whoever and uh, they've asked you for your password and your mind has gone blank? It's gone blank because over the years we've set up so many passwords and we've been given so many PIN numbers uh, that we are beginning to lose track of them. And yet, however annoying those passwords and PIN numbers may be, they are necessary for the simple reason that someone else may pretend to be you. That is what we call identity fraud, and it is one of the fastest growing crimes in the world today. People claiming to be something or someone that they are not. And the password or the PIN number is simply a way of preventing such fraud. It is a way for us to prove that we are who we say we are. And although Jesus didn't have a password or a PIN number, that is precisely what he is doing in this incident that we are looking at today. He is proving that he is who he claims to be. If you were with us last week, then you may remember that Jesus has just insisted on the complete undivided allegiance of a would-be follower. On hearing a man say that he would first like to bury his father before following him, Jesus replied, verse 22, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. In saying that, uh, Jesus was insisting on occupying the number one place and becoming the number one priority in that man's life, even before that of his immediate family. Now that, I'm sure you will agree, was a considerable uh, level of loyalty and allegiance for anyone uh, to demand of someone else. Quite remarkable. In fact, you may very well be wondering how anyone could possibly be justified in demanding such allegiance. Who does this Jesus think he is, you may be asking yourself. Who does he think he is to demand that level of commitment from us? Who is he? Well, that is precisely the question that Jesus is now going to answer. And he does so in this incident by demonstrating his authority in a storm. Which brings me to my first point this morning, and that is the authority of Jesus over the forces of nature. The authority of Jesus over the forces of nature. It was on hearing Jesus' intention uh, to leave Capernaum and cross over to the other side of Lake Galilee that the two would-be followers of verses 18 to 22 expressed the desire to go with them. Sadly, there's no indication that those two ever did go. And yet from what we are told in verse 23, it appears that some of his closest followers did get into the boat with him on that occasion. And having done so, they set sail for the other side. But we are told in verse 24, without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Situated at 600 feet below sea level, uh, Lake Galilee was known for its unpredictable uh, conditions. Hot, humid air would rise from the lake and suck in colder air from the surrounding countryside, the result being that conditions on the lake could very quickly become rough and unpredictable. On this occasion, it sounds as if they had become very rough. So rough that we read in verse 25, the disciples went and woke Jesus saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. That's how bad it was. Now, I have never been on Lake Galilee in rough conditions, 
but I have been on the Pentlin Firth in rough conditions. And just in case you think I'm boasting about some exotic holiday in some far-flung corner of the globe, uh, I should point out, in case you're not aware, that the Pentland Firth is the stretch of water between John o Groats and the Orkney Islands. When I moved up to the north of Scotland to live, I was told by some of the locals there that because of the strong currents, uh, the Pentland Firth was the second most the second most dangerous stretch of water in the world. I didn't believe a word of it until one day I saw for myself of what it could be like. Around 60 of us were packed into this small boat. Now, having arrived early, I initially had a seat, but within a few minutes of leaving the harbour, I was quite happy to vacate my seat and give it to someone else so that I could stand as close to the door as possible so that if need be, I would get a quick exit. This was the end of June, but it was frightening. And when the boat tilted that way, all you could see out of those windows was sea. And when the boat tilted that way, all you could see out of those same windows was sky. And that's how it went, the whole journey. Sea, sky, sea, sky. The whole journey was like that. And so I can begin to appreciate what these disciples felt like. And yet, however bad conditions were on the Pentland Firth that day, the conditions on Lake Galilee on this occasion must have been so much worse. I say that because the crew of that boat that I was on, the crew were smiling and laughing the whole journey. They were used to that stretch of water. They were familiar with that stretch of water. They were used to the terrible conditions that it could throw at you. And what we must not forget is that these men in Matthew chapter 8 were also used to this stretch of water and the terrible conditions that it could produce. These men were not tourists as I was on that occasion. Some of these men were hardened, experienced fishermen on this very lake. Over the years they would have experienced Lake Galilee in all sorts of conditions. And yet on this occasion, they are terrified. They think they are going to drown. That gives us some idea as to just how rough it was on this occasion. And yet in spite of the extreme conditions, Jesus, we are told in verse 26, he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. And we are told it was completely Calm. That is the authority of Jesus over the forces of nature. Never before and never since in the history of our world has there been someone who possessed a power and an authority of this type. Well, there have been many people throughout history who would love to have had this ability. And I must confess that that day I found myself on the Pentland Firth. I was amongst them. If only I could have stood up that day and told the winds and the waves what to do. What a difference it would have made to me. What a difference it would have made to my fellow travellers. But I was powerless to do anything about the conditions. I had no authority whatsoever over the weather on that occasion and neither did anyone else on the boat. This is an authority. What we see here is an authority that we simply do not have as mere human beings. Well, 2,000 years later, and we can predict a storm with tremendous accuracy. But we can do absolutely nothing to prevent the storm or to calm a storm. Due to the current pandemic, we've almost forgotten what happened during the first two months of this year. They've been overshadowed. But do you remember what January and February were like? Do you remember Storm Chiara? 
and Storm Dennis. Our advances in technology can warn us several days in advance that these storms are coming. But our advances in technology can do nothing to prevent them from coming and battering our shores. We can predict the weather, but we cannot change the weather. And yet 2,000 years ago on the Sea of Galilee, a man stood up and did just that. Finding himself at the centre of a storm, Jesus stood up and he took the storm by storm. In his power and authority, he rebuked the wind and the waves. With the result that it was completely calm. That is the authority of Jesus over the forces of nature. Secondly, we want to consider the question which this demonstration of authority raises. The question which this demonstration of authority raises. Having witnessed this remarkable demonstration of power on the lake, these men are now faced with a challenge. And that is the challenge to seriously consider the true identity of this man, Jesus. That is why we read in verse 27. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. And can I emphasise that having read and having heard of what happened back then, you and I are faced with the very same question this morning. 2,000 years on and we're still faced with this question. What kind of man is this? If this man Jesus has the power to transform the weather conditions just like that, then he's no ordinary man, is he? If this man Jesus has the right to tell the wind and the waves what to do, then there must be something different and something unique about this man. Don't you agree? Which raises a question for you and me, just as it did for those men back then. And that question is, who is this Jesus? Who is he? It's a challenge to us this morning. Because this demonstration of power and authority would suggest that he was and is much more than the religious teacher or the moral example that we usually think of this man being. I could have had the greatest religious teachers of Scotland and I could have had the greatest moral examples in Britain with me on the Pentland Firth that day, but it wouldn't have done me a bit of good, would it? No matter how clever or how nice or how wealthy or how influential or how experienced a person I had taken with me in the boat that day, I wouldn't have witnessed anything like this, would I? And so the question remains, who can this Jesus possibly be? Who is he? Well, to help us answer that question, can I remind you of what we read at the beginning of the service from Psalm 107? The psalm provides us with a record of the various ways in which God's people have known God's goodness throughout history. And here is what it says, verse 23. Others went out to sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress he stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. Do those verses sound familiar to you this morning? 
It sounds very similar to what those men experienced in Matthew chapter 8, does it not? Those words were written hundreds of years before this incident in Matthew chapter 8. And uh, what the psalmist was saying way back then is that it is God who has control over the forces of nature. It is the Lord, capital letters, Yahweh, the eternal God, the creator of the universe, who has the power and the authority that is required both to create a storm and then to calm it. It is God and God alone who can still the storm to a whisper and hush the waves of the sea. No mere mortal can do that. But, says the psalmist, the eternal God can. Which raises the question, who then is this man on Lake Galilee? Even the winds and the waves obey him. This incident on Lake Galilee demonstrates that this Jesus was and is much more than a religious teacher or a moral example. This incident demonstrates that this Jesus is the God-man. He is both God and man. Being man, a real man, did you notice that he was tired as a consequence of all that had been going on previously and so he had lain down on the boat and had gone to sleep for part of the journey. Verse 24, there we see his humanity. But being God, he stands up in verse 26 and he tells the wind and the waves what to do and there we see his deity. This incident on Lake Galilee demonstrates that this Jesus is God incarnate, God come to us in human form. Or as John describes him in the opening verses of the, his gospel, he is the eternal word who is God, but who has become flesh and who has made his dwelling amongst us. That is the truth about Jesus that this incident reveals. That is the truth about Jesus that you and I need to face up to and seriously consider this morning. What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. This incident demonstrates that here is someone who is unique in the history of our world. This incident demonstrates that this is God in the person of Jesus Christ. Who is this man? That is the question, the challenging question, which this demonstration of authority raises. Thirdly and finally, we want to consider the importance of having a correct understanding of who Jesus is. The importance of having a correct understanding of who Jesus is. Prior to rebuking the wind and the waves, Jesus had addressed someone else, and that was the disciples. Having been woken up by their cry of desperation, Jesus said this to them, verse 26, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? You see, in spite of having this infinitely powerful Jesus in the boat with them, these men still thought they were going to drown. In spite of having the creator of the universe in the boat with them, these men still thought that they were at the mercy of the weather. In spite of having the incarnate Son of God in the boat with them, these men did not have confidence in him to deal with their present crises. And the reason they didn't was because they had failed to appreciate who he really was. Well, this is not the first miracle that they've seen Jesus do. And they've been following Jesus around for some time now. And in doing so, they have heard him say a number of remarkable things. And they've seen him do a number of remarkable things. Even during the course of Matthew chapter 8 alone, they've seen him perform a number of breathtaking miracles. And yet they still have not grasped who he really is. 
They still haven't come to appreciate that he is the Christ, the long-awaited messianic king, the eternal son of God. They still do not realise that this is the eternal God in human form. That's why they haven't really trusted him in this situation. And it's not until they come to understand and appreciate who Jesus really is, it's not until then that they will trust him as they really should. And can I emphasise this morning that it's not until you and I appreciate who Jesus is that we will trust him as we should. Trust him for what? You may be thinking to yourself, I wasn't there that day in Lake Galilee and I've no intention of ever going out there on a boat, certainly not now that I've heard how rough it can be. And so what is there for me to trust Jesus for, you may be asking yourself. What is there for me to trust Jesus with? Well, although you may never find yourself in a storm as those men did, you will one day find yourself approaching death as those men thought they were. And the question is, who or what are you going to trust in to help you on that occasion? During the past week, uh, Gareth Thomas, a former Welsh rugby player, was interviewed on television about the death of his uncle during the coronavirus pandemic. And he explained how the uh, restrictions during lockdown have made the experience of death and of grieving so much more difficult. He then went on to say that he hopes that what we have been through over recent weeks will help us in the long term to be better prepared for death. Better prepared for death. Have you ever thought about being prepared for death? It's worth thinking about because although death is it's worth thinking about because although death is the one experience in life that is guaranteed, it's the one experience that we tend not to prepare for. Have you noticed that? We make enormous and elaborate preparations for everything else, every other eventuality in life, for holidays, for weddings, for exams, for retirement and so on. But the one thing that we don't tend to prepare for is death. And consequently, as the experience of these men in the boat demonstrates, the very thought of it fills us with dread and doubts and fear and uncertainty. Like them, we don't have the confidence that we are ready for that occasion. Like them, we don't have someone whom we can wholeheartedly trust uh, to help us and to keep us and to save us through that experience. And that is why, like them... You and I need to come to a clear understanding of who this Jesus is. I say that because it is only when we understand who Jesus is that we will trust him as we should. Do you remember the context in which this incident appears? The previous verses record the apparent enthusiasm of two would-be followers. But when it came to the crunch, those men would not give to Jesus the loyalty and the allegiance that he was demanding. They would not, for the simple reason that they did not appreciate who he was. As long as we consider Jesus to be nothing more than a good teacher or a good example or a health healer or a nice guy, then we are not going to trust him with the love and the loyalty and the allegiance that he demands of us. But if we come to understand who he really is, if we come to see that he is God, as demonstrated that day on Lake Galilee, then we will come to see that he is worthy of all our love, our loyalty, our allegiance, and our trust. He is worthy to be trusted with our life, our death, and our eternity. 
because of who he is. This Jesus is the one person in the history of our world who is able to prepare us and make us ready for that occasion when we will meet our maker. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Because of who he is, and because of what he has accomplished in his life, death and resurrection, this Jesus is able to bring us into a right relationship with the God who created us and the God to whom we are accountable. It is he, and it is he alone, who can be that mediator that we so much need. He qualifies as a mediator between God and man for the simple reason that he is both God and man. But until we appreciate that's who he is, we are not going to trust him as we should. That's why it's so important to have a correct understanding of who Jesus is. And so that being the case, can I plead with you this morning to seriously consider the events that took place that day on Lake Galilee? And as you do so, ask yourself the question, which those men asked back then, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him.